of Minneapolis and provide a new minority senator and two minority representatives. The judges claimed the DFL plan favored incumbents. You can't do that, they said. Why not, said the DFL. We've been doing it for years. On Thursday, six months after their conviction, the Greenwood gang over at Midwest Federal got theirs. Top honcho Hal Greenwood Jr., 46 months in the slammer, fined 3.6 million. Charlotte Mathika, a 24-month sentence, $484,000 forfeiture. Robert Mampel, 18 months in prison. He'll fork, fork over 218000 Susan Greenwood Olson will be on six-month work release, but still will have to cough up 74,000 clams. Why is it like pulling teeth to get schools to drop their Indian nicknames? On Tuesday, the St. Paul School Board needed two hours of debate before voting to abolish Humboldt High School's nickname of Indians. To believe that an institution of learning would continue to use a name and a symbol which it now knows offends and denigrates, however unintentionally, members of our community. Four years ago, the State Board of Education asked all school districts to knock off the nickname. So far, only 20 of the districts have complied. Why is this such an issue? If a nickname or a mascot or a symbol or a trophy embarrasses or insults or hurts the feelings of a group, why, why would you want to retain it? It's not even worthy of discussion. Nor is the return of the historic green belt sign and its, in, in its industrial beauty shimmering once again over the Hennepin Avenue Bridge in Minneapolis because the new owners of the old Schmidt Brewery in St. Paul are brewing green belt again. 800 feet of neon tubing, folks. A wonderful addition to any city's architectural environment. The week's most dour economic news came from Northgate Computer in Eden Prairie. It has to lay off 100 of its 485 workers in order to trim four and a half million dollars from its operating budget. Its revenues dropped 18% last year over 1990. It shipped as many computers as the year before, but it also had to cut prices to compete. Also this week, despite all the jokes, proof again that children are a blessing to their parents. On Wednesday, Victor Seiler went home from University of Minnesota Hospital less than one week after receiving a kidney transplant from his 20-year-old son, Sean. So, we should get out and give you a hug. You are giving me a heart kick. Vic Seiler spent more than four years on dialysis, but his kidneys were on the verge of failing altogether. All three of his children volunteered their kidneys. Sean's was the best match, and despite the pain of the operation, he says he'd do it again. I've never seen him look this healthy before, you know, for ten years. And so I'm just, I'm just, great. I'm just really glad it worked. This Sunday's News of the Week award falls in the wrapped in red, red tape category, and it goes to... The Metropolitan Transit Commission, which has spent $400,000 for new bus shelters, but the bus riders are still left out in the cold while the shelters remain in storage because each shelter must be approved by the landowner and the local utility companies, as well as show proof that there is a sufficient number of riders at that particular bus stop for installation. Also, the MTC says many businesses and neighborhoods fear the shelters will be used by vagrants. Oh, God forbid that some homeless creature would come in, seek shelter, seek the warmth, and sit probably right next to you in that shelter. Oh, my, no, 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 we, we can't have that. Just how much our Minnesotans is willing to shell out for education? What happens when the school referendum fails? We'll look at that story in a moment. A puzzle. With so many stomach remedies around, how do you know which you can take for heartburn? And for diarrhea? And for upset stomach, you take Pepto-Bismol to relieve most any common stomach problem, heartburn, upset stomach, and diarrhea. So who needs anything else? That is a puzzle. Pepto-Bismol is the only one you need. American appliances are the world's best. Every Amana, Frigidaire, KitchenAid, Magic Chef, and Maytag is on sale now during Winterstein's Great American Sale. Plus, you get metro delivery, installation when permitted, recycling of your old appliances, and financing absolutely free. 
Get great American value and great American service. Warner Stallion's Great American Sale. Don't miss it. Hurry. Warner Stallion's Great American Sale ends February 29th. Follow the bouncing ball to a new time slot. The Minnesota State Lottery Daily 3 and Go for 5 have moved to 6.50 p.m. Now, watch exclusive drawings every night at a new time. Live lottery drawings are only on WCCO Television, Channel 4. How many times have you heard this? Education in Minnesota is at a turning point, and it revolves around what else? Money. In 1992 alone, the state is shelling out $2,377,242,000 in aid and credits to elementary and secondary education. But that apparently is not enough. Many districts have sent out the call to citizens to vote on school referenda. Just last week, St. Louis Park approved a school bond issue by more than two to one. In all, there are 530 referenda and bond issues in place around Minnesota, but many districts still find themselves in desperate straits. Here's Daryl Savage. Just how far would you go if your school district ran out of money? Would you promise striking teachers money that you don't have? Would you use the staged picture to show classroom overcrowding in a referendum campaign? And would you sue the state to get money that may end up coming out of the pockets of a neighboring district? All of these things have either happened or are alleged to have happened here in Minnesota over the past few weeks. Many educators blame the legislature, saying funding is not keeping up with the cost of education. Some legislators say the schools just aren't managing their money well enough. No matter who's at fault, state and federal governments are having their own financial problems, so it's becoming more important for schools to raise money on their own. Take the February 4th Minnetonka referendum, for example. In a close vote, residents gave the go-ahead to classroom renovation, expansion, and updated technology at a price of about $200 million. But there's a catch. An Excelsior man has filed a lawsuit claiming that voters were misled by the district supplying inaccurate information, including this photo in a district newsletter where the lawsuit claims and a witness agrees that the children were jammed together to make the overcrowding look worse than it is. And this ad that names about 2,200 people as supporting all or part of the referendum, but apparently some people did not give permission for their names to be used. Don Willis says illegal tactics may have swayed the vote. I was angered uh, by it, and uh, it's, um, it's dishonest. That's simple. School officials feel that some of the allegations are wrong and that other charges should be filed against individuals instead of the district. This particular action is simply going to uh, forestall the school district's ability to carry out the wishes of the public. Now it's up to a Hennepin County judge to determine if the referendum will stand. Spring Lake Park teachers were standing on the picket lines in December. It was strictly a money issue. The teachers wanted it. The administrator said they didn't have it. The solution, in order to get the teachers back into class, the school board promised the teachers money they say they don't have. To do that, administrators say they'll have to change their budget again to take out another $200,000. It's going to affect all of us. We're, we're following a, a position, a concept in this district that we're going to cut across the board. Schools are also preparing for the ruling handed down from this Elk River courtroom. Judge Gary Meyer ruled that much of Minnesota's school funding system is unconstitutional. He ruled that so-called richer districts with higher property taxes can raise more referendum money for their schools than property-poor districts, and that children in the richer schools get a better education because of that. Legislators must now change that funding system, a cause for celebration for the more residential growing districts. It should mean that now we're all in the same game, and we all have the same resources to work with, and our kids will all benefit in the same manner. Since state funding is unlikely to be sufficient to give the poor districts as much money as the richer districts, some of the richer schools fear the state's only option will be to take money from the haves to give to the have-not. Well, the findings here are really disastrous for a lot of schools in the state. I think this particular ruling has done more to assure mediocrity in education for children in the state of Minnesota than anything else that's uh, probably ever taken place. 
The schools are hurting more now than they have in recent years. And when there are fewer dollars to go around, the fight for those dollars is getting bloody. Perhaps Pat Kessler with the lunatic state political system, uh, only he has a more difficult assignment than Daryl Savage, who's been uh, doing a wonderfully conscientious job in trying to keep track of the education problem. I was interested in what you're saying. How do you know that, that, that parents and teachers conspired to stage pictures so that they could uh, prejudice their, their voting? Well, it's hard for us to tell whether they conspired to do it while they were doing it, Dave. I don't know if they knew, but a parent called me and told me that she was in the classroom during a holiday party. The teacher said, okay, let's get all the desks together and let's get all the children together and take a picture. Next thing we know, that parent saw that picture next to an article talking about school overcrowding. I've been, uh, as long as I've been reading news, over 30 years or so, every year a main issue, schools want more money. The school is probably the most, education is the most gluttonous system in the state. Why is it more severe now than it has been in the past? Well, one of the main reasons, Dave, is because the schools are being required to do more and more. Mandates for special education, integration systems that we didn't have years ago. So the money is there. I don't think any educator is going to say they haven't gotten as much money as they did in the past. They continue to get more, but there are more and more things that the schools are being required to do. Such as? And that is taking money away. Uh, special education classrooms. Uh, Minneapolis just recently passed a $160 million referendum. Uh, in that referendum, they promised to lower class size. Now, they put a mandate on themselves by saying that they were going to hire a certain number of teachers so they would have a certain class size. Therefore, they can't use the money that they would use for other things. They have to use specific money for the teacher salaries. How can educators claim that legislators are not keeping up with education trends? What is that outlandish figure that I just read? Two billion, three hundred million? <laughs> yes, that's a lot of money. That's uh, 34 to 38 percent of the state's budget. The problem the schools say is that they are having to deal with so many societal problems with children who are coming to school hungry. They need to supply lunches. Uh, children who are having trouble with discipline. Schools are supplying police officers and counselors. There are so many other things that the schools are being asked to deal with because the families aren't doing that. There are so many broken mm -hmm. families. Schools, therefore, are having to deal with that, and that is costing them money. Let me get on to that Elk River judge's decision. Does he want all school districts, rich and poor, to be, poor, to be equally funded? Well, what he is saying to legislators and educators is to fix it. He's not telling them how to do it, but oh. there are two obvious ways to do that. When you have a, a division like this, one way is to bring the poor districts up. Yeah. Another is to bring the richer districts down. The richer districts are upset about that, and they hope that there is some way to meet in the middle or to bring the poor districts up. Will we see this in our lifetime? Yes, we should see it in the next couple of years. We're going to have to see it because that is what the judge says. Thank you very much, Daryl. Sitting in that chair in just one minute will be a gentleman who began his career here 16 years uh, before you were born. Take a look at this. That is not a young Don Shelby, but a remarkable possibility. We'll talk to that fellow a few years later in just a moment. This week, after 46 years with this television station, imagine that. That includes three years with its original radio station, WTCN. Bud Kraling will conclude 38 years of mistakes uh, as a television weather reporter. He'll not vanish from the scene altogether. He'll broadcast weather updates, do more reporting for our cable enterprise, but his scheduled broadcasting will be over. Bob Franzen is a man who's been a very capable broadcast executive in the Twin Cities for many years. And he loves to tell the story of how he gave Bud Crailing his start. Bob, Bob was our weather forecaster back in 54, everyone seems to think that was that year, when he made the mistake of taking a vacation to be replaced by this station announcer. Probably the most fateful vacation in the history of local broadcasting. 
I must say, however, what really made Bud Grayling was this interview broadcast on the Bedtime News in December of 1973. So often I get the question, is Bud Grayling really a weatherman, or does he just read some information prepared for him by someone else? Where do you get your weather from, Bud? Well, a lot of it comes out of the West. I mean, all those charts and graphs and instruments you use. Oh, well, they, they don't mean very much. I usually call the Weather Bureau. Call the Weather Bureau? Yeah, I say, hi there, what's the weather, and I write it down, and then I say it out loud to the folks. Well, don't you have to study the high and low pressure systems and the occluded fronts and the stationary troughs and all that sort well, of thing? Well, they have a way of working out. But what has the way of working out? Well, those things, whatever you said, those fronts, those things. <laughs> yeah. What, what kind of education does one need to be a television weatherman? Uh, what do you mean? <laughs> well, I mean such a technical subject as meteorology. It must require some special training. Oh, well, just living here in Minnesota is an education in the weather. <laughs> oh, how do you mean? Well, like in the summertime. I go outside and the sky is dark and I know it's going to rain. Yeah, if it doesn't rain? Well, then we'd go on a picnic. <laughs> when did you first get the idea uh, that you wanted to be a television weatherman? Oh, uh, I was a lad in grade school, and I'd wear my raincoat, and it wouldn't rain. Mm -hmm. And then I wouldn't wear it, and it would rain. So? Well, I knew I was qualified right there to be a weatherman. Uh, this is kind of disappointing, really, to find out that you're not... Well, I get tired of people talking to me about the weather all the time, really. Why don't you ask me about my hobbies or current events? What about current events? Well, I, I'm not so hot on current events. I, I never listen to you when you're doing the news. I'm working on the weather. Yeah, that's right. The, the folks on the street, uh, people on the street you see all the time, what's the question most frequently asked? Well, in the summertime, they ask me, is it hot enough for you? And then in the wintertime, they say, is it cold enough for you? And what do you answer? Yeah, it is. <laughs> Time has wrought some changes. <laughs> a few. The, the sunshine boys on Golden Pond. <laughs> Is there a specific day for no. your leaving your regular... I want to emphasize mm. this. You're not leaving the station. Right. You're right. just your new news. You're giving that up. No, we Are haven't you... really picked a day yet. Mm. Sometime next week, uh, I think, might be uh, one of the days. I, I'm not really retiring. I want to emphasize that. I'm just I slowing do down a little bit more. Have my, you resisted this move? They get you kicking and screaming well, as I did. I've been dragging my feet a little bit. Not yeah. not too much, though. But uh, I've been slowing down, though, about 15 years or so now. Yeah. When, I, <laughs> when, I first met, uh, when I first met my wife-to-be, Natalie, she described our relationship as going at two different speeds and used the analogy of the phonograph record speed. And she always said she went at 78 revolutions per minute and I went at 33 and a third. <laughs> But I'm going a lot slower than that. I'm <laughs> slowing down to 50. I think the station is discriminating. First I leave and then you <laughs> are work take, removed. I think the station discriminates against senility. <laughs> I think senile people all over the country ought to stand up. And, what a, well, a good Lord, 38 uh, years oh, as a I weather know. forecaster. Oh, uh, the sponsors were very important yes. back in the early days. What's the they first sponsor? Who was that were. first one? The first... Um, uh, sponsor I had was the Tasty Bread, and I was the Tasty Weatherman, and oh you would see the elaborate set, and look at that <laughs> suit. Back in the early 1950s, there was the one map, and then those yeah. little panels on the side. The hardest thing about it was to keep a loaf of bread on hand, because uh, the commercials were live. You had to have a, a loaf of bread. To oh, talk you did about. the commercials? I did the commercials. You had to have a loaf of bread in your hand, and somebody would always eat two or three slices out of your bread. During <laughs> you the left with the crust. Then, after the tasty bread weatherman, I became the shell weather tower weatherman. Oh. And the I, most oh, famous yeah. local television yeah. site in the history of the that, business. That was fun. I wore a jacket, the shell jacket. It was a one big commercial. You see shell in about seven different places yeah. there. Nobody drank any of my shell gasoline, though, so we always... <laughs> Yeah, but that. in the studio, I remember, I was the booth announcer on those occasions. In the studio, the camera would start at the bottom and had that zooming music yeah, and it would uh -huh. slowly pan up to the top and there yeah. you were in an overcoat. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We had a drawing of a weather tower and it, it, we'd, yeah. uh, it looked like you were climbing the weather tower and then you would go to this little building in the studio and 
Uh, there again, I did the live commercials for uh, for Shell gasoline and for Shell oil and all their products. Switchboard operator put the call in the announce booth, and they'd ask, "Where is that Shell weather tower?" I said, "Well, you go up County Road 52 and turn left, and you get to it." <laughs> well, we'll be around for at least a couple of more days. All right. All the days dwindle down to a precious few. September, November. And these few golden days I'll share with you, Big Finish. These golden days I'll share with you. <laughs> we better say good We may not good, be good, but we have a lot of fun, don't we? Coming out next, an ode to a favorite Minnesota food. Oh, how it quivers. Oh, how it shakes. Oh, what a large heaping portion it makes. Who knows why we like it so much? Here's a notion. It's thrilling to eat a salad still in motion. Have you guessed? Stick around to see if you're right. Things haven't changed at all in 40 years. I'm Wally the Beer Man for Budget Liquor. Now buy for less at Budget Liquor. Just look at their complete selection of beers, local, domestic, and import at wholesale prices. Now open to the public. Buy for less. Budget Liquor offers savings and selection. Buy local, domestic, and imported beer and wine coolers for less. At Buy for Less Budget Liquor. Buy for Less Budget Liquor, Shakopee on Highway 101. Buy for Less Budget Liquor, Monsview on Highway 10. Buy for Less Budget Liquor, Bloomington on 83rd and Lindale. People of the Twin Cities are fed up, fed up with old stale news at 10. They know that the news shouldn't look the same after 6. Thousands of Minnesotans are demanding fresh news, fresh news at 10. To meet the demand, Channel 4 aggressively updates the news and gives you late-breaking stories that happen after 6, bringing you the freshest news at 10. Tune in and discover why. When you're watching today's WCCO television news at 10, you won't miss a thing. Okay, here's the deal. In his best-selling book, Satirizing Minnesota, Howard Moore, M-O-H-R, claims gelatin to be the Minnesota salad. And to prove his point, Mr. Moore himself co-starred with a 500-pound gelatin salad in Rosedale Center earlier this week, scooping out spoonfuls for enthralled, anticipating passers-by. In the guide to uh, Minnesotan, I explain to people that if they visit here, they shouldn't uh, ask for a second helping of dessert when they have this. This is salad. General Foods claims the Twin Cities is one of the country's three top markets for Jell-O sales. Last year, three and a half million boxes of the stuff were sold here. Can you imagine that? In the words of the poet Peter Moore, a question that sets the mind reeling, why do we find Jell-O so appealing? It's tacky and cheap, a quivering heap of sugary substance congealing. But the answer, without being rude, is that Jell-O can alter our mood. For in theory and practice, the plain and simple fact is, we all like to play with our food. And finally, video evidence that the more things change, the more they remain the same. Remember when Boy Scouts had to set a fire, get a fire going by rubbing two sticks together? Well, they let their match use matches nowadays, but it didn't seem to help these youngsters at the Greater East Side Klondike Derby. They're going to suffocate. Stupid air. Good luck, boys. Don't forget, folks, next Sunday we're back at 9.30 in the a.m. Hope you'll be here, too. intelligence of forms, expressing the relationship of man